Uh, I want to say a few more things about open sets and closed sets, and then we'll talk about something a little bit different. So I hope we all remember uh, open means like for all x in, well, if I say a is open, right? What's the definition of that? It means that you can always put little neighborhood around your points and that neighborhood will still be contained inside the set. So for all x in a, there exists some neighborhood v epsilon of x that's a subset of a, right? That's what it means to be an open set. And then uh, a closed set, in our book, they often use A for open sets and F for closed sets. I'm not sure why. And remember, what's the definition of a closed set? Yeah. Contains all of its limit points. All right. And as we all know, open is not the opposite of closed. Like these two definitions, at least on their surface, they, they're totally different <coughs> concepts. They don't, uh, they don't necessarily have anything to do with one another. Um, but there is sort of the most important relationship between open and closed is the last, the last thing that I want to say about open sets and closed sets. It is, it's not a fact that, you know, open is the opposite of closed, but the most important relationship has to do with complements. The complement of a set, you remember this from discrete math, what is the complement of a set? That's a thing that I'm sure you talked about at some point. Yeah? Yeah, everything outside of the set, that's called the complement. So for some set A, you know, in this class we always think of A in R, um, we write, a with a little c. This is how our textbook writes the complement. A with a little c. Often it, a bar, a bar is used for complement, but since we, we use bar for closure, um, a c is the complement. That is all elements that are not in A. You could write it this way: R minus A, right? It's all real numbers that are not part of A, everything else. That's called the complement. And the fact about open and closed, it's not, it's not that open is the opposite of closed, but the appropriate and actually true fact is that if you start with an open, the complement of an open is closed, and the complement of a closed is open. That's what I want to try and get to today. So this is, I'll write that as a theorem. One of those things that I said is kind of easy to see just by thinking about pictures. The other one is a little more involved, but nothing, nothing too hard. But yeah, I'm just gonna say the complement of an open is closed. And the complement of a closed is open. Right, the complement of an open set is closed and the complement of a closed set is open. Um, so when your friends tell you open's the opposite of closed, right? The mean response is no, you idiot. They're totally different concepts. The nice response is well, it's not the opposite, but like if you take the complement, the complement of an open is closed and your friend will feel like that. Yeah, that, that must be what I meant, right? That kind of kind of means the opposite. It's not really, but um, the complement is kind of like the opposite of a set or something like that. I don't know. Depends how charitable you want to be to your friends. Uh, the complement of an open set is closed and the complement of a closed set is open. So I said the first one actually is fairly easy to see on pictures. So I'm going to do, let's do the proof of this, but the first one I'm just going to draw some pictures. So the first one, the complement of an open set is closed. Remember an open set, this one's easy because open sets, they all basically look like uh, a union of open intervals. That's what an open set looks like. It might be just an open interval or it might be a bunch of different open intervals. So an open set looks like, you know, something like this, an open interval 
maybe next to another open interval and another open interval, something like that, right? There could be infinitely many of them if you want, but it, it, they all basically look like that. That's what an open set looks like. Um, I want to show the complement of an open set is closed. Well, if an open set always looks like this, then its complement will look like... What would the complement look like on that picture? Yeah, right. It's like all the in-between points, so like here, but this time you have to fill the holes in here because those, those two endpoints were missing in the original one, so they better be part of the complement. And you can also fill in this other gap. And then I don't, I don't really know what happens off the picture, but you better put in these, these points also and these points also on the two ends, all right? But would you believe me if I said that's closed, right? That's just a bunch of closed intervals next to each other. So that's a closed set. So this is why the complement of an open set is going to be closed. Because an open set basically looks like a bunch of open intervals. And the complement of that is basically a bunch of closed intervals. So the complement will look like this. I'll just say, and this is closed. All right. So the complement of an open is closed. All right. The other one, yeah. That's true, yeah. A set union, its complement, is, is all of R. That's always true, yeah. That's not even a property of real numbers. That's, that's just a general set theory property. And the intersection is the empty set, because nothing is in both original set and its complement. All right, so this, what we've, uh, so far, the complement of an open is closed, all right? That one's kind of easy because all open sets basically look the same. Closed sets, though, so the complement of a closed is open. This is uh, more involved because closed sets can be kind of wild. Uh, closed sets do not all look like intervals. They can look like other weirder things. Actually, most of uh, today's class, we're going to talk about a particular very weird example of a closed set. So the second one, let's try this. This one we actually have to get a little nasty with it in terms of the proof. So um, we have to show the complement of a closed set is open. So I'm gonna say let F be closed and then I want to show that F complement is open, right? We have this, this one you have to kind of write a more detailed uh, proof. I'm going to show the complement is open. So what I have to demonstrate is this complement is open. How do you show something is open? You have to take any point in the set and then explain why the little neighborhood around that point is contained in that set. So when I want to show F complement is open, I have to say something like take X in F complement. And what I want to show is that there is some small neighborhood around x. I want to show there exists v epsilon of x that is a subset of f complement, right? That's the definition of an open set, but I'm using my, the set I'm talking about is f complement. So I take some point in f complement, I have to show there is a neighborhood around that point, which is a subset of f complement. All right. Whatever you say next probably will will begin with this. That's all we have to work with is X is in F complement. That means, what does it mean to be in the complement? That means X is not in F. That's, that's what the complement means, right? If X is in the complement, then it's not in the original set. And all we know about the original set is that it's closed. Um, closed, of course, means it contains all of its <coughs> limit points, right? Anyone uh, want to suggest where we can go with this? I'm going to say since F is closed, X not in F means something about X and 
Yeah? X is not a limit point of F, right? F is closed, so all the limit points of F are in F. And X is not in F, so X is not a limit point. Okay, excellent. Not a limit point. What does that mean? Uh, remember, if I said it is a limit point, that means something like x is here. If x is a limit point, it means there's a bunch of points that get like really close to x, right, from, from f. But it's not that. So what that means is, it's not that. It's, it's more like x is just like over here somewhere. It's, it's not right next to a bunch of points from f, all right? Is that, is that what we wanted? What I'll, remember what I wanted to show is this. There's some in, uh, neighborhood which is in F complement. Yeah? Yeah, right. Because this is not a limit point, it means in fact, there is a little neighborhood around here which doesn't hit any points from F, right? That's what it means that X is not a limit point. So X is not a limit point of F, so there exists some neighborhood of X with um, V epsilon of X contains no point of F, right? The neighborhood around X does not include any points of F. That's what it means that X is not a limit point. And I think that means what we wanted to show. This is weird language, but this says the neighborhood is a subset of the complement. That means everything in the neighborhood is not in F, which is what this means. This contains no point of F. So this is actually the same. V epsilon of X contains no point of F, i.e. V epsilon of X. Maybe I'll say it this way. Every, just to make it clear, every point of V epsilon of X is outside F, right? That's what this means. So that means V epsilon X is a subset of F complement. And that's what we want. Mm-hmm. There you go. This is mostly a bunch of a bunch of definitions, but a, a little a little tricky, I suppose. Um, I saw a tweet this weekend, some some like uh, viral math tweeter. It was a they said. Um, what do you like to write at the end of your proofs? It, I think it was like a Twitter poll. QED, or there were a few different choices. I replied, shoo, I got zero likes, <laughs> zero re retweets. I, nobody really, nobody follows me on Twitter, so I'm used to it. All right, any, uh, any thoughts about that? So, Remember, the, the moral of the story, the complement of an open set is closed, the complement of a closed set is open. All right, this is the big relationship between open sets and closed sets. One last thing I wanna say before we talk about, I said we're gonna spend most of our time today talking about a particular weird example of a closed set. Um, if you recall, we showed a while ago, recall, that any, um, union of open sets is open. Actually, this was one of the, one of the test questions. Um, although this statement, any union means even, even infinitely many, um, any union of open sets is open. And also any finite intersection of open sets is open. 
an infinite intersection, sometimes you can, if you intersect infinitely many open intervals, for instance, it can shrink down just to a single point, which is not open anymore. But if it's a finite intersection, then it will remain open. All right. Uh, this business, actually, you kind of, for free, can get facts about closed sets. <coughs> because every closed set is a complement of an open set. Um, you just have to think briefly about how does complements affect unions and intersections? And this also is something that you should remember from your discrete math class. Anybody actually remember this? If I have two sets, this is not just in analysis, but in, in any, any kind of set theory. Um, there was a rule about this, A union B complement. Anyone remember what that is? Something about A complement and... Yeah, it's A complement intersect B complement. And there's a similar rule for intersections. The intersection complement is A complement union B complement. All right, so um, this is called De Morgan's law for sets. De Morgan's law for sets. And this is just true in general of set theory. So the, uh, the, the sort of slogan version of this is uh, complement changes unions into intersections and it changes intersections into unions. All right, so what that means is looking at these facts at the top here, if you just do complements on that, a union of open sets is open. This automatically means an intersection of closed sets is closed. It's because a, a union, when you take a complement of all those open sets, in their union, it turns into an intersection of the complements. So any union of open sets is open. This stuff here, sort of for free, I don't want to go through the details, but you basically just use De Morgan's law. Um, it means, I'll write this as a new theorem, any intersection of closed sets is closed. Even an infinite intersection of closed sets is closed. This is why, for example, uh, well, uh, this should remind you of the nested intervals property, that nested closed intervals, when you take their intersection, you can end up with something that's not an interval anymore. It can be like a single point, but that's still a closed set. Any intersection of closed sets is closed. And any finite union of closed sets is closed. It is possible to make an infinite union of closed sets and it will become something that's not closed anymore. But if it's a finite union, any finite union of closed sets is closed. All right. And this is the end of what I want to say about open sets, basics of open sets and closed sets. Any thoughts about all that? Complements play nice with the open sets and closed sets. All right, great. So we got 30 minutes left. Um, I want to talk about an important, I will say, wild example of a closed set. I've said often that open sets are not really wild. They are just op open intervals next to each other. That's what open sets look like. But there can be closed sets which look very different from closed intervals. Uh, this is an important example closed set. It's called the Cantor set. Cantor, this is the guy who uh, came up with the idea of different sizes of infinities. And he also talked about the Cantor set. You know, Cantor, um, his original proof of that, that thing that the R is uncountable used the nested intervals property. So he was very much into um, this kind of, this type of uh, analysis that we're talking about. The Cantor set, here's what it is. It's a little bit hard to visualize. It is a closed set, which doesn't look like an interval. And unfortunately, you can't really draw a picture of it. And you also can't draw a neat little definition of it. So when your friends on the playground ask you what, what exactly is the Cantor set, it involves a long explanation, unfortunately. But once you have the idea in your mind, it's not, it's not so, I mean, it's very weird, but it's not so hard to understand. Anyway, the way you construct it is it's sort of built in stages. Built in 
stages. So the first stage is you just start with the um, interval from zero to one. The closed interval from zero to one. This I'll call, I'll, I'll call this C1, all right? C2 is the next stage. It's the closed interval from zero to a third. Union the closed interval from a third to, to uh, sorry, from two thirds to one. So you basically cut the previous one into three equal pieces and you throw away the middle piece and you keep the other two, All right? You trisect it, if you will. And then you, um, you get rid of the middle third and you keep the first two thirds, or the, the other two. All right, that's the second stage. The next stage, in each stage, you remove the middle thirds of everything that you've got. So the next stage looks like this. These guys and these guys. Right? Every time you take all the intervals in, in the set that you've got so far and you remove the middle of them. So the next one, C4, would look like this is about as small as I'm gonna be able to draw on my paper here. Right, and I say dot, dot, dot. And what you get in the limit of this thing is the Cantor set. Um, the appropriate question is what do you mean dot, dot, dot? And what do you mean, like, what, what you get in the limit? Well, actually, you can say pretty clearly what you mean by this sort of dot, dot, dot. So the definition, the Cantor set, is C, all right? It's the intersection of all these. The intersection of all of those. This kind of looks like nested intervals. I mean, they're not, the whole thing is not intervals each time. It's like a union of intervals, but uh, you just take the intersection of all of those and that's the Cantor set. All right. If I were to draw a picture of what you end up with, it's not easy to draw. In fact, is there any guarantee even that we end up with anything or is this, I mean, could this be the empty set? Actually, it's not the empty set. If it was, I wouldn't be talking about it. But uh, can anyone say, like, can you tell me a number which, which exists in this set? Yeah? Yeah, zero and one are both part of the Cantor set because they never get, they never get eliminated. Every time you are, you're wiping out the middle of each of the intervals, you never eliminate the end uh, zero and one. So I will say this includes Zero and one. Can anyone say uh, another number which this includes? Yeah, one third and two thirds. These these numbers here, right? Those were not uh, original endpoints, but they were endpoints in this intermediate step, and they never get removed uh, after that. So zero, one, one third, two thirds. Any other? Yeah, all the endpoints that ever appear in any of these intermediate stages, those endpoints are never removed. Um, basically everything else is removed of, of other than those endpoints. And what exactly are those endpoints? It's not really easy to say. You could say something like they are, um, sorry, what I just said is not, it's not true. The endpoints are not the only thing that ends up in the set. That's actually part of what's weird about this. Um, let me just say, it includes zero, one, a third, two thirds, can I just say, and all other endpoints. Of intermediate stages. Those are all, uh, you could say those are all rational numbers whose denominator is a power of three, right? Because the in the next stage, they would be like uh, one ninth 
two ninths, not three ninths though. Well, no, three ninths would be in there because that's one third. But there's some. There's a ninth right in the middle, which would not be part of of this set. But some of the ninths. Um, a number like one fourth is not in the Cantor set because it's not a ninth. It's not a. It's not a power of three in the denominator. All right. Anyway, this includes uh, a lot of numbers. So here's some basic properties about the Cantor set. First of all, C is not empty. That's just because of what we just said, right? Because it includes zero and one and a whole bunch of other things. Actually, it includes infinitely many things. C is infinite as a set, right? Um, what else can we say about it? I think we can say that C is closed. I said that all along. C is meant to be an example of a weird closed set. Can anybody say why is C a closed set? How do you know it's closed based on something we just said? Yeah, because it's an intersection of these things are definitely closed, right? These individual intermediate steps are all unions of closed intervals. And any, uh, we just said this, right? Any intersection of closed sets is closed. So the Cantor set is an intersection of all of these things which are made up of closed intervals. So C is closed. All right. It's a non-empty closed set. It's infinite. In fact, um, any, any thoughts about is it countable or uncountable? This is how you know, actually, those endpoints are not the only points in it. If, um, if the endpoints are the only points in the Cantor set, then that means that every element of the Cantor set is, is rational, because these endpoints are all rational. They're all like ninths or whatever. But actually, it turns out the Cantor set is, in fact, uncountable. Um, that means its cardinality is the, same, the size of R, not of uh, Q. So I want to try and explain why. The Cantor set is uncountable. Uh, why is that? It's a little difficult to um, prove that a set is uncountable. That Remember, the way you, to demonstrate it's uncountable means the elements of this set cannot be listed in a list where the elements go one after another, because that, that would be countable if you could write them in a list. Why is it uncountable? Well, um, if you want to choose a point, I'm going to copy this picture down just so that I have it down here. Let's say I have a point in mind in the Cantor set that actually like survives all the way to the end, right? Let's say this is x in the, in the Cantor set. Um, there are many ways to describe what x is. Like as a real number, I suppose you could try to write down the decimal digits of, of x, but that is, um, I don't know, that's, uh, that's a little tricky to, not useful for what I'm going to try to say. Another way you can describe x is, um, Points in the Cantor set. Come on. Can be described um, by lists of, I'll say, L's and R's, meaning left and right. Uh, if you think about how can you describe exactly where X is, you could describe it in terms of like give me directions on how to get to x if I start from the top. In the first stage, should I go to the right or to the left? The answer is to the right. If you want to end up at x in, from the first stage, you better go to the right. And then in the next stage, which way should I go? To the left to get here, right? Just think about every time you go down one level in this sort of hierarchy, you either have to go on the left side or on the right side. And any point that actually exists all the way on the bottom must be described by some kind of infinite description of L's and R's. This would be a R followed by a L followed by a, a L again. So this point here, you could say is described by this sequence, R, L, L, etc. I don't, I can't tell on my picture uh, any more than that. But every point of the Cantor set is described by an infinite sequence like this, right? 
this sequence has to go on forever in order for your description to actually make it all the way down to wherever your point is. So points in C can be described by lists of L's and R's, and I mean infinite lists, each of them. All right. You can think of this as something like a like decimal digits of of x. It's not decimal digits go base ten. This is more like uh, I don't know one one step after another. You are describing in each step a little bit more precision about where exactly the x is. All right. That means anyway, points in C can be described by lists of l's and r's, infinite lists. So that means if I try to list. I wrote tist, list. That doesn't mean something, does it? It sounds, it sounds inappropriate somehow. If I try to list all elements of C, it'll look something like this. You know, maybe uh, the first one, X1, is like a L, R, L, 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 R, R, L. Etc. Right? Every element of the Cantor set has a description like this. I'm just making this up at random. Maybe X3 is R, R, L, L, R, L, R, R. Right? If you think you can write all the elements of the Cantor set in a big list, your list would have to look like that. And then, and you remember our, the Cantor, this is Cantor's diagonalization argument. We can always, no matter what this listing looks like, we can always create another point which must be omitted from the list. Uh, even if this goes on forever, I can construct, I can, I wrote can twice. I can construct points missing from the list. You don't remember how to do that? What, what would it look like in this example? Yeah. Yeah, you look at the diagonals here. Actually, it's not quite what she said. You want to make it so that this, this one that I'm building is supposed to be different from all of these. So in each of the diagonal positions, you swap it. So instead of L here, I choose R first. And then L, and then R. This one is obtained by reversing each of the circle positions. And because I'm reversing every time, the fact that I reverse the first one means that this point is not equal to x1 because it differs in that, that spot. It's also not equal to x2 because it differs in this middle spot, or the second spot. It's also not equal to x3 because it's different in the third spot, etc. All right? Anyway, all of this means it is not possible to write a list of all the elements of the Cantor set. And so the Cantor set is uncountable, all right? So no list can include all points of C, right? The Cantor set is uncountable. All right, there's another nice description of the Cantor set in terms of numbers in base three, if you write all your numbers in base three, <laughs> like decimals, decimal expansions, but in base three, it's basically the same as these R's and L's. Um, these are numbers, these numbers and these numbers, if you think of decimals in base three, these are the numbers where the first decimal digit is a one. These ones are where the first, sorry, these are where the first digit is a zero, these are where the first is a one, and this is where the first is a two. If you think of digits after the decimal point being zero, one, or two, all the zeros go here, that's less than one third, all the ones go here, all the twos go here. The, another way of describing the Cantor set is, this you could say to your friend on the playground as a, as a simple definition of the Cantor set. It's all numbers in the interval zero to one, where when you write their decimal digits, base three, there are no ones. That's what it means. The fact that I removed this, I removed all the numbers which have a one after the decimal point in the first position. This spot and this spot are the ones which have a one two positions down in the decimal uh, expansion, and so on. That's kind of confusing, though. 
um, to your friend on the playground. Anyway, C is uncountable. This, by the way, means there must be many more points than just the endpoints. Because, for example, all the endpoints are rational numbers. But if this thing is uncountable, that means it has to include many irrationals. Because all the rationals are, are countable by themselves. Yeah. No. An example of a number in the Cantor set that's not rational? Oh, not an endpoint. I just said no, although if you believe what I said about the, I was, I was just saying something about base three decimal digits and nobody seemed to be into it. Just looking in your eyes, I could tell you were not into it. But um, if that, that would be a way that I would describe an irrational number that's in the Cantor set would be something like uh, 0 0.0200200000. Like this, where these digits are read in base three. That's an irrational number because it it doesn't have a repeating pattern. I mean, it, it does have a pattern that I hope you can see, but it's not the kind of re repeating decimal pattern that would make it rational. And it's in the Cantor set because I never used a one anywhere, which means when you, when you put it on the line, it never falls in the middle part of each third. It is either on the left or on the right of each one of those. Because I never used I never used the middle digit. I used either zeros or twos every time. So this in base three um, is irrational. And it's in the counter set. Yeah. Strange but true. Base three, I shouldn't say decimal digits base three. Decimal means base 10, the, the word should be. That's called ternary sometimes, ternary digits. I've heard it called tresimal, which sounds stupid to me. Um, all right, we have 12 more minutes. Some more, uh, some more interesting facts about the Cantor set. Really, I only had one more to talk about today, and then another, another one we can talk about next time. Um, C is closed. My last fact is C is not open. All right, uh, it is closed. Now, one way you can immediately see that it's not open is just because we've already said a few times, the only, the only open set, the only set that's closed and open is the empty set or all of R. And so since we already know that C is closed, it's not also open because it's not, we know it, it can't be both open and closed. But actually, it's also kind of easy to see just from the definitions why C is not open. I can say, you take any point, say X in C somewhere. Is it possible that there's a little neighborhood around X which is entirely uh, part of the Cantor set. So is V epsilon of X a subset of C? So I have, I imagine the Cantor set is some kind of, well, I always just think of this whole picture. Sorry to scroll away, I'm copy this down. Cross the page break. All right. If I have some point that's actually in the Cantor set down here in the intersection, is it possible to find a small neighborhood around that point which is totally inside the Cantor set? Anyone have a feeling about that? I see some shaking of the heads. Can anyone give me a, maybe a reason why? How do you know that this interval entire this entire interval cannot all be part of the Cantor set. I would say it has something to do with the way that this is constructed in, in stages. I don't know. Is it like between the endpoints that the intervals are way on Yeah, so that's true. If if you if you actually if X happened to be one of these endpoints, then definitely it this neighborhood is not part of the Cantor set because <coughs> part of this neighborhood stretches off off the side of one of these. But what if X is not one of the endpoints, just one of these other weird, you know, like this, this ridiculous number, um, which is not one of the endpoints. 
Could you put a little neighborhood around it without stretching outside the set? No? Yeah, so this, if you want to think of it in terms of those uh, base three expansions, you can say any real neighborhood of this point, this contains all real numbers near that point. Uh, many of those real numbers will use one in their decimals, right? I mean, they, the Agumbi numbers would choose any, any digit in their, um, in their decimal expansion. So yeah, that's one way. This is not the way that I was going to say it, but uh, yeah, any, no matter how small that interval is, it must contain real numbers that use one in their decimal digits somewhere. And those numbers are not in the Cantor set. And so that means this little interval cannot be part of the Cantor set. Um, I was going to say this is maybe n no better in terms of technicalities, but um, this, the, the whole point of the Cantor set is every, um, in every stage, you remove the middle of whatever intervals remain. All right? It's not possible to have an entire interval at the bottom because if there was at any stage an interval the next stage would just remove the middle of it right and so any interval like this um, couldn't exist as a full interval in the Cantor set because in previous stages it would have had the middle of it cut out at some point all right um, so my answer to this I'm, I'm not going to try to write all the details for that but is the epsilon neighborhood part of C I'm going to say no C actually contains no interval, either open or closed, it doesn't matter. C cannot contain any intervals because part of the construction of the Cantor set is that every interval is going to get its middle chopped out at some point. C contains no intervals since intervals always have their middles removed. And so it's not possible to end up with an entire interval, no matter how small it is. You can't end up with an entire interval, interval that somehow survives all the way to the end because its, it's middle should have been chopped out at some point earlier on. All right? Um, the very last thing that I want to say about the Cantor set, and this we really don't have time to get into it, so I'll just, I'll just give you a little very brief introduction. The Cantor set is what they call a fractal. Maybe you heard about this. A fractal. You've probably seen some very fancy pictures and I, uh, I'm going to bring some fancy pictures of fractals to uh, show us next time. But what that means, is that a question? I have a question. Yeah. It's not necessarily all the fractals, okay. it's all the set in general. Yes. Uh, no, so this, uh, there are actually many Cantor sets. If you're talking, you know, you meet someone in the club and you're talking about the Cantor set and you want to be more specific, this is sometimes referred to as the middle third Cantor set. Um, there, you can do the middle fourth Cantor set. They all have basically the same properties. The middle fourth Cantor set um, is, I suppose, uh, you cut the middle fourth, you keep a little bit more stuff than in the middle third Cantor set, but you still, you're still going to get the, basically the same thing at the end. Like it's, the individual points are not the same points, but it, they, it has all the same kinds of properties. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's no, you have to do th at least thirds, so there's no such thing as cutting it in half. There's no, I don't know. Hmm? Nah, not really. I mean, it's it's a little. You can remove the middle fourth of something if you want to. No. No. no I mean, it, this whole length is one, right? It is possible to make that one fourth. 
it's just a little weird. Like then the two the two ends have length, I guess three eighths each. Like it's weird, but it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it works out nicer if it's an odd, an odd denominator. Yeah, then it's a little nicer. Yeah. Uh, let me just say what what I mean by fractal, and then we'll we'll talk a lot more about this uh, next time. Um, a fractal is uh, sometimes we use the word a self similar shape. Self-similar, meaning the shape looks the same as itself at a smaller scale. Uh, what I mean by that is, if I look at the whole Cantor set, which looks, it's some limit of this kind of thing, right? Um, here, C, all of C, versus what if I only considered the right half, the points on the right side, versus considering the whole thing. Now the points on the whole thing, I have eliminated the middle thirds of a bunch of segments. Actually, maybe, can I say, I'm just gonna circle the left side instead. It doesn't really matter. But, um, all of C versus just the left side. The left side, in, in terms of the end point of it, the left side is like kind of half of it, right? Um, but if you took that half, the left-hand side, and multiplied everything by um, two or maybe two-thirds, you could get this whole thing to like evenly stretch out to the whole width, right? And if they stretched out, because of the weird sort of infinite nature of this thing, actually this would stretch out to be exactly the same picture again, the whole thing, right? Because all the middle thirds would still be removed. So all of C versus just the left side, these sets are geometrically the same. I mean, one is just a rescaling of the other, right? The left side is just a rescaling of the entire picture. This is what I meant by that, that phrase. The picture is self-similar. That is, the whole thing is a rescaling of one of its parts. This is very strange, um, and it's hard to think of ordinary examples that are like that, apart from very ordinary things. So uh, I'm going to say, um, uh, the whole set is a rescaling of one of its parts. All right. Um, if you tried to make a shape like that, you probably wouldn't be able to. This is a very strange property, except for very similar, very simple things like a line segment has this property. If I only consider half of the line, this, the left half of the line is a rescaling of the whole line. That's true. But anything else, you know, a curvy line, that's not true anymore. It's not true that the left half of this curvy line is a rescaled version of the right half. Um, not in general, at least. This, um, it's not only just that the half here, but actually if you, if you grab any little subset of this, it is a rescaling of the entire set. Yeah. It's kind of like if you were to zoom in at yeah, if you zoom in to any individual point, it just looks the same forever, all the way down. Yeah, right. And this is probably, if you've seen pictures of fractals, that's probably what you've seen. They have these very sort of psychedelic zoom-in um, properties. Yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that next time. See you next time.